Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem tuple with the same product. And I really, really like this problem because it involves a decent amount of math. Now don't worry, when I say math, I don't mean a bunch of formulas that you're gonna have to memorize or anything like that. It's gonna involve some mathematical thinking. So let me kind of walk you through that right now. So the idea is we're given an array of distinct positive integers. The fact that they're distinct is pretty convenient for us. What we want to do is form all possible tuples of size four. So there's going to be four elements. We're going to call them A, B, C, D. And what the tuple needs to satisfy is that A times B is equal to C times D. And so the thing that you need to remember about a tuple is that the order does matter. So if I draw pretty much the same tuple, but I just swap these two values, it's still technically true. We could also say B times A is equal to C times D. And then we could flip the other two sides. So I'll do A times B first, and then B times A after that. And then here we could have D times C, and we could also have D times C down here. You can see that while the products on both sides are the exact same, we were able to rewrite the equation in four different ways. And we could actually get four additional ways just by taking all of these and putting them on the right side and taking all of these and putting them on the other side. I think I said right side a second ago. I meant left side, sorry. But basically what we've realized is that if we find four values that satisfies that condition, then we've actually found eight tuples. Every time that happens, we found eight new tuples. And so that's why in the first example, you can see that it's not a coincidence that we have eight over here. And it's also not a coincidence in the second example, we find one formula one times 10 is equal to two times five. Each side is equal to 10, as you can see. And we found a, a second formula two times 10 is equal to four times five. Each side here is 20. So this is gonna be eight tuples and this is also gonna be eight tuples. So we end up with a total of 16 tuples. Now I'm not quite done yet. You might be thinking that, okay, well, there's definitely a brute force solution to this problem that can run in N to the fourth time. And yeah, there probably is. I don't know how easy it's going to be to code that up because to be honest, I didn't do it. It just seemed like it would have been really, really tedious and also that it probably wasn't the intended solution. So I was thinking of some other solutions and that's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a more optimal solution that actually runs in N squared time. But before we can do that, let's try to build up some intuition. One thing that you could say about this second example in particular is that we had two different ways that we could total up to 10. So one times 10 and two times five. So basically for the product that is 10, there were two ways that we could create that uh, number. And same thing with 20, actually. We could form 20 in two different ways. So just to be clear, this is like N1 times N2, and this is the count of how many ways we could form that. If, for example, we had something like a one times 30 and we could only form 30 in a single way, well, then we can't really satisfy the condition A, B, C, D, where this times this is equal to that. So to me, it's kind of becoming clear that we don't necessarily need to loop over everything. Even if we were looping over everything, and we had four different loops and the first two loops pick these two numbers. Well, yeah, we could loop through the rest of the numbers and try to find all pairs that have the same exact value as this. Or why not just do some pre-computation and instead of looking at numbers four at a time, why not just look at numbers two at a time and then just get the counts of those. And then somehow maybe we can use these counts to determine the total number of tuples. So maybe it's possible. Let's try exploring this. So if I had a mapping like this, and I think it's obvious that probably we'd want to use a hash map or something like that for this, and we could build this data structure in N squared time just by iterating over every possible pair, and then just like tracking the counts for each product. Suppose we did that, and then we ended up with a hash map that looks like this. What exactly would we do with it? Well, let's just scan through it and let's say, okay, 10, how many ways could I form that? 
two different ways. So that means I could probably build the equation A, B, C, D in exactly one way because I have two pairs. That's what this is telling me. So I'm going to draw it like this. I have P1 and P2. While there are technically four slots that we are trying to fill, we know that each of these pairs technically makes up two different numbers. We could say this is A and B and maybe this is a C and D. Well, in this case, I think it's obvious we could put one pair that fills one of the like pair slots and then the other pair would fill the other pair slot. And so this way, we wouldn't count this as one tuple. We would count it as eight tuples. And then we would scan through the other guy, this over here, and do pretty much the same thing. So then we'd have eight additional tuples. And lastly, for this guy over here, 30 only shows up once. So actually, we don't have the second pair. We only had a single pair, and that's definitely not enough to satisfy the entire equation. So this guy, we would skip. So now it becomes obvious that we would only care about the ones that have a count greater than one. So at least it has to be two. But what if it was actually three? I think this is one possible way where we could end up with three different pairs. They all equal a 12. So 12 will have a count of three. So that tells us we have three pairs. Let's call them P1, P2, and P3. We have four slots that we're trying to fill, but we know that each is kind of grouped into a single slot. So here's what we could do. We could do this P1 and P2, or we could do, and actually I can just kind of draw them here. So P1 and P2, or we could do P1 and P3, or we could do P2 and P3. Each of these is technically a different equation. And part of the reason for that, like the guarantee is that we know that all the numbers in the input are going to be distinct. So we can kind of be sure of that, but all three of these are going to be different. Each of these deserves a count of eight. It can form eight different tuples. So we'll get eight plus eight plus eight. Okay, so now to kind of summarize a few of the findings that we have made, because while this is kind of building the intuition, I don't think you're probably sure of what exactly the equation is going to be. Like, what do we do with this count number? Let me kind of show you. So I'm going to draw a little table over here. Suppose I have a count of zero. Well, that, that's going to lead to all zero, so I'm actually going to skip that. But if we had a count of one, when I say count, I mean this over here. We have a product that shows up a single time. Well, we know that we can form zero pairs. And when I say pair here, I mean like the equation that we can like satisfy. If we only have one of these, we can't really satisfy that equation. If we have two of them, we can satisfy that equation once. So I'll put a two here and that means we can satisfy the equation once. And if we had three, we can actually satisfy the equation three times. Now, if we have zero pairs or like that many times we satisfy the equation, we will end up with zero tuples. If we had one, we will end up with eight. If we have three, we will end up with 24. So I'm going to fill in two more rows here and maybe you'll be able to figure out the pattern by yourself. If not, that's fine. I'll try to clarify it now. I'm not going to draw out everything to fill in the rest of this table. I'm actually going to use my intuition. I'm going to say if I had four count, then how many like pairs from those counts could I create? So like if I have four of these, how many can I create? Well, I know with three, I was able to create three pairs. So with three, I can create three. Now that I have four, I introduced a new one. So with the introduction of this new guy, how many more can I create? Well, with four, I could do four and one. I could do four and two, or I could do four and three. So I can take three additional and put them here. So whatever I had before plus three. So I'm going to put a six over here. And we know that to go from here to this, that's like the very, very straightforward part. So here we'll just get 48. Now, one more time, just to really drive this home, I have five now. With the introduction of P5, I can now do this, 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 and this. So basically four more. So whatever value I already had plus the count that I originally had. Now with the fifth, I can create four more. So I'll take six plus four and I'll put 10 here. And then here I'll get 80. This is just a multiplication of eight. So now knowing all of this, there's actually two different ways to code this up. 
One is by using a, a second hash map. So we already have this hash map up above. And if we create a second hash map, which doesn't track the counts like the first hash map is doing, we will actually track this with the second hash map. So that's one approach. And the second approach is there actually is a math formula that can take this value and map it to this one. It can take this value and map it to that. It can take this and map it to that. I'll cover the math one after the hash map one. I'll probably just cover this in the coding explanation. But I want to briefly cover the first one because I think this one might be easier for some people who don't really like math. I think this one is actually more reasonable and I think it's pretty intuitive. So let me briefly cover that. We're going to have a second hash map down here. So I'm just going to kind of group this into a hash map. And then down here, I'm going to have my second hash map. If I see a pair, suppose 1 times 12, I'm going to take 12 and increment the count here. So uh, let's initially say that this is zero, but now we increment it to one. We also know that to calculate the value here, going uh, from here to down here, all we do is take the original value and then add to it this one. So I know this part is probably like kind of complicated conceptually. In terms of the code, it's actually going to be pretty easy. So let me just kind of show it to you. Let's say we initially had a zero over here. We're going to take zero and add it to this second hash map. So for 12, we're going to say it's already mapping to zero. So add zero to it. It doesn't really do anything. And then to this, we're going to increment it by one. This part is always going to be easy because we're always going to increment this by one. So now let's say we found another pair of 12. Maybe it's three times four. I'm going to increment this by one. But before I increment it by one, I'm going to take the value that's here and add it down here. So now I have a count of one down here. And now I'm going to increment this by one. And now I have two up here. So that looks uh, pretty correct to me. And suppose we add one more. Maybe it is uh, six times two. Before we add one to this, we're going to take this value. So like this and add it to this one. And that's how we find the next value that's going to go here. So that's exactly what we're doing on the right side as well. We're going to take this two and add it down here. We're going to end up with three and then we increment this simply by one. So now this will also be mapped to three. If we did it one more time, then this would have been added here, giving us a six down here. And then this would have been incremented by one, giving us a four. And you can see that is indeed correct. And the whole reason that we are building this second hash map, giving us all these, is that we can easily take this and just multiply it by eight to get the next one, which is the number of tuples. And then ultimately, we just want to get the total number of tuples. That should be easy enough to accumulate. So all this said, let's jump into the code now. So let me just reset this. And uh, what we ultimately want to do is have these two hash maps. I'm just going to copy and paste them. So one is the product count. So that's like n1 times n2 is how many like of those that we have. Also, the actual number of pairs. And when I say pair, I mean like an a, b, and c, d pair. I know that maybe the wording of this could have been a lot better. And I'm sorry about that. But hopefully you kind of get what I mean. So next, we are just going to have a couple nested loops. So I in range, and then we'll have the second pointer that will start after that, just like this, because here we want every distinct pair. And then we want to take that pair and get the product. So this times this, and then we can take the product count. And what we want to do is increment this by one. But it's very, very important that you only increment this after you update the pair count. And the pair count is going to be updated with uh, the key is going to be the same, the product. But we're going to add to this whatever value happens to be in the product count before we incremented it. So that's why we do this. I mean, I guess you could move this line below this one. You would just need to add a minus one here. So uh, just make sure you do that correctly. Now, after all that's done, the problem becomes pretty trivial. We can just do this, declare our result. Initially, it's zero. That's what we want to return. And then we go through every value in the pair count. We don't really care about the key. We just want the value. And so we can say this for count in product or sorry, pair count dot values and then add to the result eight multiplied by this number. So that's pretty much all we have. Let's go ahead and run this. 
Now you can see here on the left, it does work. I promise you it's pretty efficient, but we can improve the time complexity by a factor of two. We can get it to like this range where uh, it's about 300 milliseconds. And mainly we do that just by getting rid of the second hash map. I think the overhead of the second hash map is what leads to the lower uh, runtime. So let's get rid of this hash map and let me show you the formula. First, I'm gonna write out the formula for you. You might think it's magic, but then I'm gonna explain it to you. So uh, we can get rid of this as well. And then instead of going through the pair count, we'll go through the product count. And to this result, what we're going to add is this magic number, count multiplied by count minus one, and then divide all of that by two. It looks like magic. And actually, uh, let me get rid of this. This is actually equal to the number of pairs. So once we have this, we will add to the result eight multiplied by the number of pairs. So let me first run this. You can see here, it does work. It does improve the time complexity. I don't, I think if I ran it again, we might get somewhere closer to here. It's not really a big deal to me. But why exactly does this formula work? First, let me show you that table again. If I have a count of one, then I get zero. If I have two, then I get one. And from five, I get 10. Remember the intuition of how these are calculated though. This number will just be what we already had plus two more. And this number will be what we already had plus three more. This number will be six plus the four more. So in other words, if I want the number of pairs here, can't I just aggregate all of the counts? Can't I just say that technically 10 is equal to one plus two plus three plus four? Can't I say that six is equal to one plus two plus three? Well, yes, I can. I can put that into an equation, but then how am I taking this and calculating it like that? Why don't I need a loop to do this? Because it's true. We could get the pairs uh, with a loop. Like we could say for I in range the count and then keep adding I to the pairs, but that would obviously be less efficient. So why am I using an equation to do it? Well, it's actually pretty simple. The intuition is this for this formula here, I have one pair of five. I have one plus four, which gives me five. I also have two plus three, which gives me five. So then I have that two plus three. If I had a longer series of numbers, it would have been slightly different. It would have been something like this, five and six, in which case I would have had one plus six, which gives me seven. Two plus five gives me seven. Three plus four also gives me seven. This is a really a famous math equation. I think it's pretty easy to derive. Like you could have kind of derived it from like the intuition I was giving you here, or at least possibly. But anyways, I think uh, the person who came up with this, or at least it's attributed to a Gauss when he was like a little kid, but I'm pretty sure a lot of people have came up with this before. Um, but anyways, so how does all of that translate to this formula down here? Well, if I have five, that gives me 10, which is this formula, um, getting rid of these two. And so the pair of numbers adds up to five. How many pairs do we have? Well, that's gonna be count minus one divided by two. So if I wanted to, I could rewrite this formula to make it a little bit more simple. Count multiplied by count minus one divided by two. It's technically the same if you simplify it. That's just kind of how like multiplication and fractions work, but maybe rewriting it this way makes it more clear. And it also does work when we have an odd number of pairs. So for example, with six, which was over here, four, that tells me one plus three will add up to the number four. How many pairs do we have? Well, we have three numbers here. So that's why I'm taking the count, four count, minus one, and then that's three. I divide that by two. I have 1.5 pairs. So what this equation will do is it'll be four times 1.5. That does indeed equal six. And the reason for that is we have one pair, three plus one, that's four. And then we have half of a pair, which is exactly two, half of the value. This is why I covered this solution after the first one. I think the first one is a bit more intuitive if you're not a math person, but if you like math, I think this one is pretty easy as well. But anyways, if you found this helpful, definitely check out neatcode.io for a lot more. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.